Please have this passage open in front of you if you can. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 11 to the end of the chapter. We're looking at a, a kind of little series here on Sunday evenings looking at the subject of relationships and I started it last week by looking at chapter 2 and the first 10 verses where we looked at our wonderful relationship that the Christian has with God. But at the beginning last week I reminded you that when I was a young person, uh, which was not that long ago really, uh, growing up, I remember in church now and then we would get a talk on relationships and I remember sharing with you last week how utterly terrifying the whole experience was. And um, But now you're a little older, there's one thing about relationships, if there's one word that sort of sums up relationships, I think it's the word complicated. Relationships are sometimes extremely complicated, and yet they are foundational to the way in which we function as human beings. So it just as we looked last week, we looked at, if you like, the great relationship that the Christian has, a foundational relationship, which is our relationship with God. And that's what we were looking at in verses 1 to 10 of Ephesians 2. Tonight we're going to look at our relationship with one another, at least begin to start to look at that. And that's really what the second part, the verses which we read, verse 11 to the end of chapter 2 of Ephesians, are pointing to. And we're going to see here tonight how Paul has to address the potential for huge, violent division in the church. And we're going to see that how he approaches this with the gospel, showing us and reminding us that all who come into this wonderful relationship with God belong ultimately to one family, which is often referred to as the church or the body of Christ. Well, very quickly, let me remind you, for some of you who weren't here last week, uh, maybe this will be helpful, setting a bit of context. Verses 1 to 10 are about our relationship with God. And we saw last week that the relationship with God that the Christian has has come entirely as a result of God's work in our lives. If you like, the coming of the gospel to you and the transforming work of the news of who Christ is and what he has done came as a kind of intrusion into your life. For some of you, it was almost a violent intrusion. There you were, wonderfully minding your own business in life. Everything was going great. And you thought you had everything sewn up and summed up. And, uh, you know, you understood the world, the universe, and life, and everything. And then suddenly you came in contact with the Christian gospel. And it turned everything upside down. Or at least, as you know, now know, it turned everything the right way up. But it came suddenly. Maybe you weren't brought up in a Christian home. And uh, maybe it was your very first encounter with Christians. I don't know. Where you, you met someone in work, or maybe it was at college, uni, or something like that. And they spoke to you about Christ. And it was a sudden intrusion. In fact, you couldn't get away from it. Uh, you would go to bed at night, you find these thoughts going around in your mind, and almost the bittersweet experience of saying, well, well, really, I don't know that I really want to be interested in this, but you couldn't get away from it. And so rather drawn like a moth to a flame, you found yourself exploring the gospel, and you realize in retrospect now as a Christian, as you looked back, that this was God's wonderful intrusion of his grace, pushing himself wonderfully into your life out of mercy and kindness. Now, verses 1 to 10 of chapter 2 show us very clearly that the work of God in bringing us to faith is a work that he does. It's all his work. And it is a work of love. And this is a wonderful starting point for us, which we saw last week, that understanding that you're a Christian as a result of God's love, God's mercy, reaching out to you, intruding into your life, the more you begin to understand that, the more you as a Christian will be moved to respond to God in true worship and service. One hymn writer summed it up with this line, Say while lost in holy wonder, why, O Lord, such love to me? We know that's the case in verses 1 to 10 because there's one word that really dominates that passage and it's the word grace. 
Now, as you know, a lot of people think grace is that little short prayer that's sometimes said uh, before a meal. But actually, the Bible, the New Testament in particular, when it speaks about grace, doesn't use that word in that way at all. It speaks about the fact that God has shown mercy that you didn't deserve and that I didn't deserve. Of course, that's the great conclusion that every Christian comes to, is that none of us deserve God's love. None of us are good enough. And this passage drives home the wonderful reality of God's grace. It is by grace you have been rescued. I've told you many times before that when I was growing up, uh, my father, who was a preacher, uh, used to teach me and my brother uh, in a very simple, natural way what grace was. And it would always be the summer holidays, down at the beach, running around, playing games and all that kind of thing. And... We would be perhaps very tired at the end of the day, um, going back to where we were staying, passing the ice cream van. And uh, he would say, well, boys, uh, you've got your holiday money. If you want an ice cream, go and get one. And um, that was fine for my brother, who's very good with money. Uh, But for myself, I was always spent out usually by the second day, certainly by the third day. And uh, he would look at this predicament, and probably looked in particular at the rather wistful expression on my face, and then he would reach into his pocket and take out, I don't know, 250p's or whatever it was then, and he'd say, boys, this is grace money. You don't deserve it, but I'm giving it to you because I love you. Now, I couldn't care less what you called that. I really couldn't. All I knew is I was getting an ice cream and and he was paying for it. And that is grace. And Ephesians 2, 1 to 10 is dominated by that word. It's It's the awareness that if you're a Christian, it's because God has been like that to you. He's saying, I'm giving you this. Not because you deserve it, but because I love you. It's an amazing, wonderful thing, isn't it? Well, uh, there's so much more we could say, and we mustn't get too sidetracked on what we uh, looked at last week. But it was a kind of conclusion you come to at the end of verse 10, which is that, well, God has done this. He sent his son Jesus into this world to live a perfect life, something I can't do. So thankfully, I don't have to worry about trusting myself. I can just look at him and trust him, the perfect life that he has lived. But the incredible thing is that that perfect life was laid down on the cross. And there he died, not for any sin that he had committed, but because of mine. And that if I put my faith and trust in him, I will now be forgiven all of my sins, past, present and future, brought into the family of God and be given a new nature and a new heart. That's what a Christian is. At which point we must inevitably find ourselves asking a question that the next part of Ephesians 2 kind of goes on to answer, which is, well, that's all wonderful, but now what? Where do I fit in in the wider scheme of God's work of grace in other people's lives? And the answer you kind of get really from verses 11 to the end of chapter 2 is that the great intention of the God who has shown grace to you in bringing you to new life through faith in his Son is that you should be now part of his great family, growing and becoming stronger with other Christian believers. Now, we're just going to glimpse tonight the the tip of the iceberg of this in terms of relationships, but it's interesting that as Paul the Apostle Paul writes here, He is writing really, it seems, and it's implicit in his language, to address a problem. Now, the church and to the Christians that he was writing is in the place called Ephesus, hence the letter to the Ephesians. It was a church in a part of the ancient world which was often referred to as Asia Minor. It was Greek in identity, but it had been overrun by the Romans and had become a Roman colony. In fact, it had become the Roman capital for the region of proconsular Asia. And like all cities under occupation, its identity in terms of its original roots, Greek, was very, very powerful. Now, cultural identity is something we know a lot about here in Wales. We know that there is a uniqueness that comes from living in Wales. Here we live in a certain place, 
we share common experiences, we have a common history. And for the 19% of the population in Wales who claim to speak Welsh, there is also a common language. In other words, we know who we are as Welsh people. And knowing who we are comes also with the knowledge of who we are not. And we're very aware sometimes who we're not, aren't we? If Wales is playing England, we all know who we are then. There is this defining, we're Welsh, we're not English. And of course in the stands there are the English people and they're thinking the same thing. We're English, we're not Welsh. Cultural identities. But knowing who we're not can sometimes come at a high price. In fact, there can be huge problems. Cultural identity, all the good things about knowing who you are in terms of a nation, can sometimes come at a high price. And the high price is you can look down on those who are not part of your culture, are not members, if you like, to put it in its most primitive form, of your tribe. So the world very quickly becomes about, well, who is like you? Welsh, or in this case, Greek. And who is not? We see it in sport probably most clearly. You see it in other things in life like politics. You know, Who is Labour? Who is Conservative? Who is Plaid Cymru? We like our tribes, don't we? We like to know who we are and certainly who we're not. Now, its worst manifestation of knowing who you're not is sectarianism. And it's its real worst, it's racism. Here there is the belief in absolute exclusivity to the point that people believe no one is as good as us. No one is as right as us. And no one ever will be like us. We are the best. When I grew up, uh, my parents, I used to be fascinated by my parents' um, record collection. And amongst them were the songs of, um, oh dear, uh, I've forgotten the names now. <laughs> anyway, um, <laughs> this is going to backfire, isn't it? <laughs> um, uh, Flanders and Swan. There we are. In fact, Donald Swan came from Llanelli, isn't he? Interesting. <laughs> Flanders and Swan. They would have these sort of late Victorian, early 20th century songs. Some of them were very funny. Um, you know, but I, I, won't, I won't inflict them on you. But there was one which I loved, and it was on the B-side of a little single, and the chorus went like this. The English, the English, the English are best. So up with the English and down with the rest. And then they went through all the home nations, as we would call them now, saying what was wrong with us. I thought it was fantastic. But not because I saw myself as being English, not at all, living in England, very much in a Welsh home. But I appreciated the kind of jingoism. Now, in its light sense, it can be humorous. But left unchecked, it can become something very, very dark and very, very destructive. When I ministered in Yorkshire, I started the ministry there, um, I remember one man teaching me a little quaint Yorkshire saying, all the world's mad, save me and thee. And that was a bit queer. <laughs> and there can be that sense in life, can't there? That all the world is mad, except for us. We have got it right. And even then, we can be a bit suspicious of one another. The results of that, left unchecked, can cause deep divisions and scars. The consequences of not being in or part of the tribe can result in exclusion, or even sometimes something far worse. Now, the point is this. The church of Jesus Christ is not immune from this kind of destructive behavior. It should be. The wonderful gospel that is summed up in chapter 2 in verses 4 and 5 with these words, but because of his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. Those words should be enough. They should, they're words which uh, reach across all the barriers and all the divisions. I mean, grace by definition has to do that, isn't it? I mean, grace is God's kindness to people who don't deserve it. And the diagnosis of the gospel is that the whole world does not deserve it. It reaches across the barrier of sin. It reaches across the barrier of guilt. 
ultimately before the gospel, every single human being is an outsider, is a foreigner, if you like, until grace takes hold of us. So it is particularly ugly when we may find within the church of Christ, the body of Christ, division and sectarianism. People believing that somehow others who claim to follow Christ and trust grace and rely on grace and trusting in the gospel are really not quite like us and so we keep them at arm's length. Such things can be very, very destructive. And it's a particular problem in the church because if ever that happens, it becomes a kind of practical denial of what the gospel, the good news of Christ, actually is. It's fascinating that one of the later books in the New Testament, the, Paul, uh, the letter of James, uh, really addresses this. That if in any sense favoritism should be shown in church, it becomes a very serious problem. Listen to these words from James. It's very practical, this. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand there or sit on the floor by my feet, have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my dear brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world, to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised to those who love him. The challenge from James is that certainly we should never show that kind of discrimination. So somebody who's, who's scruffy and unkempt shows up at church one day, they should be absolutely as welcome as a person who's turned up and is very finely dressed. But the point is this, you see. Regardless of our appearance, regardless of where we may be coming on the social spectrum of our world, when it comes to the church of Jesus Christ, we all come through the same grace, the same gospel, via the same cross of Jesus Christ. And if ever we fail to demonstrate that by giving in to favoritism, by giving in to partiality, we deny the gospel. Instead of doing that, there is, of course, to be unity that is shown out and lived out in the church. Jesus, on the night he was uh, betrayed and gone to be arrested, is in a room with his disciples and uh, he's teaching them certain things. And then towards the end, he says, I'm going to pray for you. And so he does. But in John chapter 17, he goes on to pray for others who weren't in that room. And the ones who weren't in that room are all Christians everywhere throughout all time. Listen to this from Jesus' own prayer. My prayer is not for them alone. That is the disciples who he's just been praying for who were in the room. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me. May they be brought to complete unity, to let the world know that you sent me, and have loved them even as you have loved me. You see now, being one, being together, resisting the temptation for unnecessary division, party spirit, sectarianism, but being one becomes, says Jesus in that prayer, an announcement of the gospel to the world. Why is that? Well, it's because of the sheer reality of it. What else can bring together those usually opposed to each other? And on such a scale as this. This is more than politics or ethics. This is something deeper. What else can bring people who are so divergent, so different, ages, in terms of culture, in terms of social standing, can bring them together like this? 
And Jesus is implying in that prayer that that is the kind of question the world should be asking when it sees the church. And the answer he gives us is, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Now back to Ephesians 2. It seems that there was a temptation for the Gentiles in Ephesus to miss this. To slide into sectarianism, into party spirit. By the way, this wasn't just a problem for Ephesus. It was a problem for many Gentile churches. In many ways, it was the great social challenge to the gospel in the early church. And certainly it would be the case until persecution would become mainstream. And it wasn't just a problem for those who were Gentiles, Greeks. But it was also a problem for Jews in Jewish churches as well. That somehow there should be the belief that one group, Gentile or Jew, was somehow better than the other or more important than the other. And this actually is a major problem in the New Testament. You see it cropping up from time to time. One of the clearest examples of when this sort of party spirit and division between Jew and Gentile erupts is in Paul's letter to the Galatians. There in chapter 2 he says, when Peter came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he was clearly in the wrong. So what was it that Peter had done that was wrong that Paul had to take him on about? And we're told that what happened was this. Before certain men came from James, Peter used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, these men from James, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. The other Jews joined him in this hypocrisy so that by their hypocrisy even Barnabas was led astray. When I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter in front of them all, you're a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? I'll unpack that very quickly. What had happened is this. Paul had gone to a church which was made up of Jewish and Gentile believers. They were one. And when he got there, he found Peter who was there and he'd been there for a while. And someone had come along and had influenced Peter and Peter said, no, actually, we shouldn't be one. We should separate them out into two groups. We should have Jewish group and we should have Gentile group. And when Paul sees that, he says, I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel. This is deeper than cultural difference. This is a denial of the gospel. And so I opposed him to his face. You see, the truth of the gospel is it changes everything. That's why in the next chapter, Galatians 3, Paul will write, there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. You see, that's what the gospel does. It strips away, it levels, it flattens out all barriers and distinctions. Why is it then that the Christian gospel can say that when it comes to following Christ, it's not a matter of being Jew or Greek, slave or free, male or female, and by the way, those were the big social either or categories in the ancient world. Why is it that the gospel flattens all of those out? And the answer is that, well, if you happen to be a Jew or you happen to be a Greek, you happen to be a slave or you happen to be free, you happen to be male or you happen to be female, the message is the same. You are all guilty before God and all in need of his grace in the gospel. And you all need Jesus and you must come to him in faith. That's the truth of the gospel, you see. So when you get in church situations, as there was in Galatia, a big split like that, it becomes a very, very serious thing. There are lots of other things we could talk about. There's just one more that I want to mention, which uh, it's interesting that it's mentioned that this happened in Antioch. 
And uh, there's another little incident about the Church of Antioch on this business of uh, kind of division in church. And it's in Acts chapter 11. It's a very wonderful one. There'd been a terrible persecution, you see, and Christians had had to run for their lives. And some of them had ended up in Antioch and they began to form a church. And this is what we read in Acts 11. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks also. And you see, up to that point, it was Jews speaking to Jews. But now it seems in Antioch, Jews began to speak to Greeks, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. And he goes on to tell us that the Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of them believed and turned to the Lord. Now news of this reaches the ears of the church at Jerusalem, and they're not quite sure about this. So they send Barnabas to Antioch. When he arrived and saw the evidence of the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged them all, that is now Jew and Greek, Jew and Gentile, to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. It's no coincidence then, is it, that it is that Antioch becomes the first place where followers of Christ are now referred to as being Christian, Jew and Gentile followers together are simply known as Christian. Why is that? It's an expression of oneness in the gospel. Now, I want to stress something to you. It's become quite a thing in this last century, in the last century, in the middle part of the last century, to speak about those from a Jewish background coming to faith in Christ as being messianic Jews don't like to use the word Christian. I have a problem with that on the basis of what took place at Antioch. In fact, somebody who pointed this out to me is a Jewish man who pastors a church in Israel. He has a problem with it. Why? In Christ, there is oneness, wholeness. There are not to be these distinctions. And it's this wonderful thing that in Antioch, the very first place, it seems, where Jewish believers started speaking to Greeks about Christ, that they are first called Christian. In the family of grace, we must be very, very careful about trying to make distinctions between those who are genuinely in Christ. We are all Christians, followers of of Christ. Now in Ephesus, Paul realizes that the Gentiles there must realize that they're not special or separate from those who are Jewish. There was a time when they were. Verse 12. There was a time when they were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope, and without God in the world. Now, that's a description of how they were before they became Christians. There was a time, Paul is reminding them there, where Gentiles, that's, that's those who are not Jews, were generally excluded from God's grace. And that's what you see mainly in the Old Testament. There are rare individual exceptions, but generally pagan nations were left untouched by the grace of God. They were cut off. They were left out. And this was because under the old covenant, Israel was exclusively the object of God's grace and affection. Israel was uniquely the people of God and the holy nation. Gentile nations were not. They were unclean and ungodly. They were outside of the purifying corrective influence of the gospel. But now, through grace, this has changed. Verse 13 of chapter 2. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ. Now, this is Christ's work through the gospel and its grace. The grace that saves us, though, Paul is now going on to show us, also removes the barriers between people, as we've heard. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female. No, you are all one in Christ. 
The gospel penetrates all of those divisions. The gospel is, I suppose, the ultimate expression of equality. And that is to be seen now in the church. The church is to become an outward, visible expression of what the gospel does and can do. It's to be made up of men, women, young, old, all strata of society. It's one of the problems you hear sometimes, people setting up a church simply for, um, I don't know, one of the classic examples at one time was to set up a church for bikers. It's wrong, isn't it? On the basis of what Paul is saying here. There are to be churches which are welcoming to everyone, that are inclusive of everyone. And so Paul puts it in this way. Verses 14 to 16 of chapter 2 are very penetrating. He himself, that is Christ, is our peace, who has made the two one. Who are the two? Jew, Gentile. And has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. For thousands of years there have been a terrible barrier, Jew, Gentile. No, he says, Christ has now, in and through the gospel, made these two one. He's destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by abolishing in his flesh the law with its commandments and regulations. Why did he do this? His purpose was to create in himself one new man out of the two, thus making peace. And in this one body, to reconcile both of them to God through the cross. So Paul cannot be clearer when it comes to the Jew-Gentile issue, which was a major social, cultural division in the ancient world. The gospel removes this. It destroys the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. Christ does it, and his purpose is that now by being in him, Jewish believers, Gentile believers, might not be two distinct camps within the church, but they might now be one new man. His purpose was to create in himself one new man out of the two. How has God done this? Well, verses 17 to 18, he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. What is that a reference to? It couldn't be clearer. He came and preached peace to you who were far away, Gentiles, and the same message, peace, to those who are near, Jews. For through him we both have access to the Father by one Spirit. So where does this leave them now, particularly these Gentile believers, understanding that it's not a question of I'm a Gentile Christian, and here is a Jewish Christian, and ne'er the twain shall meet. Consequently, he says, verse 19, it's a good word that, isn't it? Consequently, as a result of all of this, you, Gentile believers, are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets which Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. So he uses a picture and illustration of a building now. In him, the whole building, made up of Jew and Gentile, is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. So because of what the gospel is and does, and because of the new covenant, Paul is able to dress Gentile Christians in these very dramatic terms. He says, you're no longer foreigners and aliens. There was a time when that was the case. But instead now, you are fellow citizens with God's people, Israel, and members of God's household that once was uniquely Israel. The faith of Gentile Christians is also built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. So under the new covenant, Jew and Gentile are in Christ Jesus. And in him, the whole building is joined together. There are no two separate camps. There is one building, one body. And this is what Jesus came has done. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those 
who were near. Now this is what the gospel does. It's radical. It's life changing. But it becomes status changing, society changing in a very, very wonderful way. And the history of the church is littered with examples of those coming from hugely opposing social groups on both sides, coming to hear the gospel, having their lives transformed through faith in Christ and now meeting and worshipping. I mentioned about a, a man who I know is a pastor in Israel. His church is made up of Jewish people and Arab people alike, worshipping together, living together, sharing their faith with the world around them together. That's what the gospel does. It brings together. And this is the beginning of where we understand what it means about relationships in the body of Christ. The Christian family is a big family. And we're to take the principle from this. You're to say, well, this is all very interesting, but Jew-Gentile issues aren't a particularly big issue in Sanathli. No, they're not. But there are other things, aren't there, which can come along and cause barriers within churches. And we have a responsibility to make sure that no such barriers exist within the church between those who proclaim to know Christ. There's not to be age barriers, young people, old people. It's just people together in Christ. It's not about being rich or poor or wise or foolish or healthy or sick or getting on with life and, or failing to get off the first step in life. We are all one in Christ if we have come to put our faith in Jesus Christ. It's the awareness that you as a Christian can look at any other person anywhere, in any culture, in any context, who like you says, Jesus Christ is Lord. He died for my sins. I believe he rose from the dead and my faith and trust in him. You can look at that man and call him brother. And you can look at that woman and call her sister. Regardless of how young or old or whatever the situation is. We are to guard this, aren't we? Jesus' prayer in that upper room was so specific. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message that all of them may be one. So we need to search our own hearts. Am I guilty of discrimination? Am I guilty of showing partiality? Do I only speak to old people in this church and neglect the young people? Or do I just spend my time with people who I'm familiar with and comfortable with? And I don't reach out to people who I don't know or maybe find a little bit different or even a little bit threatening. We're not to be like that, are we? No exclusivity. No sectarianism. We're one in Christ. And we're by the modeling, the showing of our oneness to the world, we're to model the gospel to the world. Well, that's our starting point for looking at relationships in the church. And I hope next week, or rather in two weeks' time, we're going to go on and look at how these may become so strong and so helpful to helping one another grow as Christians and also how we can encourage one another in times of difficulties.